Curtis Nolan from Sulphur Springs Valley Electric Cooperative in Southeast Arizona. Welcome to Along Those Lines. Support for this podcast comes from Census, who would like to share the idea that not all AMI networks are built the same. See how Census is simplifying the move from legacy PLC systems to RF wireless at census.com slash PLC. Hi, everyone. We're here at NRECA's Tech Advantage Conference and Expo talking about electric cooperatives, the work they do, and the challenges they face. I'm your host, Scott Hoffman. The American workplace is changing dramatically, and it's a trend that's driven by things like waves of retiring older workers, new technologies, and the changing needs of younger workers. And electric cooperatives are right in the middle of this, with some additional challenges that are unique to their rural environments. We talked to Cheryl Cran, a consultant, author, and expert on the workplace and leadership, and Holly Wetzel, NRECA's Senior Director for Marketing and Member Communications. Cheryl, Holly, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's great to be here. Thank you. So Cheryl, what kind of changes are you seeing in the workplace right now? You're kind of keyed into what's going on across the board. What are the biggest challenges you're seeing? What are the changes that are most affecting how people do business? I think there's three. Number one is obvious, technology. Technology is changing everything. It's changing the way people want to interact as customers. It's changing the way workers want to work in their workplace. It's changing what we defined as work in the past and how work is changing in the future. So I say technology is number one. Number two is the shifting demographic of worker and what they're thinking. So that demographic of worker is thinking, you know, the millennial and the Gen Z, which we're hearing a lot about now. And by the way, when I talk about generations, it's not about age. It's not ageist. It's not that one generation is better than the other. It's simply the research that is showing that the values and the work styles are shifting with these generational differences. Okay. So, you know, millennials and Gen Zs are not living to work. They're saying, I'll have a life first and work fits into my life, which is a complete massive flip to how it's been in the past. And then thirdly, I would say change itself, believe it or not. People are struggling with making the change, both mentally and behaviorally, to drive business forward to where it needs to go. What is it that these younger folks or the generations you mentioned, what's their life experience that makes them want these things that they're so different from what the workplace used to be? Well, actually, they're products of us. Yeah. So it's our fault. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the Zoomers, I call baby boomers Zoomers, which is a baby boomer who refuses to age. So the Zoomer parents and the traditional parents, so let's start with traditionalists, the post-war. They were very fiscally prudent. It was about you know holding on to your resources. It was about not living to excess. So the Zoomers were children of those traditionalists. The Zoomers grew up, you know, in the in the 60s, 70s, 80s going, well, I had the restrictions of a traditionalist upbringing. I want to live more to excess. So the baby boomers are the ones in the 80s and 90s that we started to, you know, really increase volumes of business, increase the resources, increase the success. They then had their Gen X kids and their millennial kids. Gen X is the generation that's bridging the Zoomers and the Millennials. It's a smaller demographic, but Gen X was sort of on the cusp, and I'm actually a Gen X Zoomer cusper. Anybody born between 63 and 65 would be in that range. So the Gen Xers have had a foot in that traditional reality, but they've also got a foot in the fast pace of change because in the 90s, downsizing, right-sizing, restructuring was pretty much the norm at that time. So cut to the millennials and the Gen Zs, those are the children of the Gen X, the Zoomers. And I believe in all the research we've done is that the Zoomer parent didn't want their children to suffer. They wanted them to have more. They wanted them to be more. They wanted them to be able to have more success than they did in their lifetime. So that created a raising them in a way of you can be and do anything. And if you're college professor says that, you know, you only got a a B on this, negotiate for an A. You know, we really have raised our kids to be much more success oriented. So that's why a millennial Gen Z shows up in the workplace today and goes, hey, I'm wonderful already. Are you going to promote me in six months? Or where's the technology for me to do my job at a high level? Or, you know, I don't have to be here for 20 years like my mom and dad were because frankly, I'm going to have 20 careers in my lifetime. So there's this complete shift in just societally, how we're, and, and technology, and, you know, voice, voice activation, facial recognition, that's going to continue this shift towards life first, work supports life. And I would just say, you know, this shift in demographics and generational shift is definitely happening at the co-ops. If you look at 
the distribution of generations within the workforce at cooperatives in 2018, it was 42% were millennials and Gen Z. But if you look at the new hires in that same year, um, 67% of new hires in 2018 were millennials and Gen Z. And you even have some um, younger than that. That's, so. Yeah. <laughs> and Cheryl, I know you kind of look at the workplace across the board. Are you seeing from your research and, and the people you're talking to that the rural workplace is experiencing these same kind of internal changes? Definitely. I mean, one of the common questions we get asked is, is this happening in every industry? The answer is yes. Is this happening globally? The answer is yes. <laughs> is it happening rurally? The answer is yes. And the reason for it is, so it used to be that if you lived rurally, you were removed or remote from right? A lot of what was happening globally, that's no longer the case. Because of Wi-Fi, because of the Google University, people have access to information. So, you know, when we look at rural, yes, there are unique challenges to recruiting to rural. However, research is showing that millennials and Gen Zs are actually looking for rural lifestyle again. So we're seeing a cycle back. So it's how you market the rural. One of the things I've done a lot of work with clients in this regard saying like if the community that you're attracting them to doesn't have the real life efficiencies or you know, for example, a Starbucks, quite simply, or entertainment for children. It's not the job that's going to attract them. It's actually a bigger issue. It's a community issue. Yeah, and we're having that conversation a lot in the program. Yes. Go ahead, Holly. Well, and that's where like broadband comes into play. Like, if you don't have broadband service in some of these rural areas, that's going to impact who's willing to come there and raise their kids in that environment. Yeah. And we saw that in our young adult member research. Speaking of kids yeah. um, and opportunities for kids I mean, in many of these communities where co-ops are the prominent leaders in the business and community space, they're looking to the co-ops to provide those opportunities for their kids and those gathering places and events, enrichment activities right. for their kids. Yeah. So. And I know, Holly, some of the research we've been doing, some of the surveys we've been doing with our members indicates that they're, they're very worried about waves of retiring employees, people aging out of the program, as well as the ability to attract young employees into the co-op. Talk about that dynamic a little bit and, and how it kind of squares with, with Cheryl's finding. Right. So <laughs> right now, um, there's more than 27% of the total co-op workforce that is eligible or past eligibility um, and still working um, for retirement in the next five years. That's a pretty small, narrow window. And if you look out 10, 15 years, it's even greater. So you have challenges with some folks, as Cheryl mentioned, you know, the generations that came before us stayed in these positions for decades. And the co-op offers a great job environment and great benefits, reasons to stay. And so the challenges of knowledge transfer, the challenges of as these new generations do come into the workforce, and we see from these hiring numbers that the shift is is happening, so you have this mix of generations. And it's not unique to cooperatives how to deal with that mix, but it's definitely something to be mindful of and how to ensure that new employees and tenured employees both are valued and both have incentives to to stay and perform and have the tools and technologies to perform. And with the shifts in the industry and how rapidly things are changing, you know, it's important to ensure that the new employees understand the history and where we came from, but really can focus on the future and what's coming. That's what the members are expecting and that those tenured employees can do the same. So when we think about training and education and tools for our membership, we're looking at both groups. How do we help both groups, all groups of employees, be successful in the changing energy environment? Yeah. So that's a really good segue to some of the things that you've been talking about lately, Cheryl. The idea of shared leadership, performance culture, things like that. Talk about how that is shaping the internal culture. And if you can, kind of tie it into some of the stuff that Holly's talking about with the rural market. Yeah, I think what you're doing at NRECA is already really indicative of being future ready. So, you know, just in my observations and talking with Holly and the team before coming here, I think the point of making sure all generations get their needs met. So for example, when you talk about change, if you're saying to a traditionalist or somebody who's been around for a long time, 
you have to learn this technology, but they've only got three years before they retire. That's a very difficult sell. And it's just psychologically true. So you know, a lot of our work is around dealing with the truth and then treating people with respect as to where they are and then going from there. So some of the strategies that work around some of the challenges, and we did talk about this last night, mm -hmm. you know, for example, we facilitate reverse mentoring where the younger millennial Gen Z mentors upwards to the traditionalist or the Zoomer around technology and those kinds of things, which has been very successful, you know, matching and pairing uh, those two generations together. And then conversely, the traditionalist and the Zoomer sharing all the history and the knowledge transfer that they can. To the point of knowledge transfer, some of the things we've done, organizations have said, you know, how do we get these traditionalists and Zoomers to share what they know? Because a lot of times, remember, in that era too, you kept your information to yourself because it was all about he or she who has the most information wins. In shared leadership, that's not the case. Actually, the more we share the information, the more we collectively benefit. So it's less about me and more about we. And so this is the shift we're making. So we want to meet people where they are and have compassion and empathy for their challenges in making the changes and then providing the tools and resources that will help them make that change. So for example, if I've got a Zoomer who's been on the job for 20 years and I say to that Zoomer, you have to knowledge transfer to this millennial. I can promise you in their mind they're going, no, I don't. I don't have to do that. I, I've been here for, you know, don't ask me. However, if I said to that Zoomer, hey, you know what, you have so much knowledge, we're going to follow you around with a video camera for the next week, and you're going to tell us everything you know, and we're going to put that in a database, and AI is going to parse out that database so that anybody searches it further down the road is going to know exactly what you knew in order for us to continue driving the business. Now the Zoomer goes, hey, easy for me. All i got to do is work and do my job. You're following me around. Mm -hmm. You're not threatening them. And, and I think this is a really key part. I know with Next Mapping, that's I think what we do really well is helping people make change in a way that is organic and natural and not fighting people's inclinations to protect and uh, keep things to themselves. That's very cool. Along the lines of tools and, and resources, let's get into some of the tools that, Holly, you've produced as part of the Young Adult a Member Program. But first, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. This month's Along Those Lines podcast is sponsored by Census. You might be surprised at how far AMI has come since the early days of power line carrier systems. It's not just about meter reading anymore. Today's RF wireless networks quickly identify outages, measure end-of-line voltage, and give you the power to make informed, data-driven decisions. See how the proven PLC to RF wireless blueprint from Census is designed to simplify the migration to next-gen AMI at census.com PLC. I'm Carrie Testament from Jackson EMC in Jefferson, Georgia. You're listening to Along Those Lines. Welcome back. We're talking about resources that we can use to, uh, to help get everybody on the same page in the workplace. Holly, you've been working on the Young Adult Member Engagement Project that we've been doing at NRECA. There's already lots of resources available. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of those resources and then what's coming next? Sure. So the Young Adult Member Engagement Initiative is a joint project between NRECA and Touchstone Energy. And we kept hearing from co-op leadership across the board that how to engage with this next generation of members and young adults was a real challenge, one of the biggest challenges they were facing. So that's what led us to develop this tool. And we went out and did research. There was a lot of existing research that we already had. And then we went out and did focus groups with young adults in this age group or members you know, living on co-op lines to find out what their values and interests and service expectations are from their co-op. And it's probably not that surprising because some of these things you know, are not exclusive to young adults. These are societal changes that might have been born in these generations and have trickled out. But, you know, a need for speed and ease of use, personalization, personalization of service. You know, these are, you think about the 25 to 45 year age group is kind of where we've focused. This is a group that came of age in the age of Amazon and Netflix and smartphones and being able to instantly get anything delivered to your home right. within a couple days. So we did all this research, found out what the values and interest and service expectations are um, of this generation of members. And when you look at the demographics of the membership and you take into account, you know, rate payers in rural America on co-op lines, more than a third of them are under 45. And if you take the entire household, including the kids in those homes who may become future rate payers, it's more than half of folks on co-op lines are in that under 45 age group. So 
we have created tools to help people understand how to communicate, what the expectations for communications are, what these folks value most and what will resonate most with them and how we connect with them and how we engage with them. We found that with this age group, community above all is the thing that resonates most about a cooperative and that they value most, the fact that we're locally owned, locally controlled. So, you know, I encourage co-ops to lean into that community aspect when they communicate. So we've created these communications tools and resources, information on all the communications channels that matter most to this age group and unfortunately the answer is all of them matter. Um, digital and print both perform well among this group but now you know we've learned what matters to the member and what they expect. They expect this future focused community focused cooperative that's giving them choices, that's transparent, that is thinking about the environment, that's thinking about innovation. All of these are tied into all of the broader changes in the energy industry. So now that we know that, how do we help the co-op workforce adapt and adjust to meet those changing needs? So the next phase of the Young Adult Member Engagement Project is actually focusing inward on co-op culture and it's going to be creating some onboarding and ongoing employee education tools showcasing co-op examples of effective programs to enhance um, engagement and help co-ops better adjust within their workforce to all the changes that are happening. That's great. And Cheryl, along the lines of what uh, Holly's been talking about in terms of how the programs that you institute inside, the culture that you change, how it impacts your consumers, your, uh, your customers. Mm -hmm. What are you telling your audiences, what are you telling your clients in terms of what they're gonna get on the other side of this, why it's important in terms of their, their business? Well, frankly, quite directly, the future viability of your business. Right. It sounds so trite to say change or die, but the reality is 40% of Fortune 500s won't be here in the next five years. That's a, that's a real live statistic. Mergers and acquisitions are going to continue to be a reality as the future meets us. Organizations who are not digitally mature are going to find themselves being bought out or acquired by digitally mature organizations. Right. Organizations who are not adapting to this life-first work reality across the board of generations because now Zoomers and traditionalists are going, wait a second, I want a life too. So it's not, you know, the millennials have actually driven that awareness around work-life balance. So there's actually a value there that they've brought through that mindset. So the costs are high if you're not building that performance culture. And in my work, you know, I do get people that come up to me afterwards and go, oh, this is going to go away. Whatever happened to good old fashioned hard work or, you know, you, you hear these things all the time. And it's like, yep, okay, that's, yep, that perspective is valid. And the days of working nine to five and sitting in your desk or out in the field proving that you're working, those days are gone because it's about results. But you can only get results if you're engaging, inspiring and collaborating within the culture. So it's, it's basically you have to. And I think what you're doing at NRECA is very indicative of being future ready by providing the tools. We can't make people use the tools. However, the tools are there to be used and leveraged and valued. And the fact that you offer the tools to the co-op, that's fantastic. There's a lot of organizations out there that they're just starting out identifying what those tools are. So you're in a situation where you've identified them, you've created them, they're available, and now it's how do we incorporate them into our business? And I think it's a huge opportunity. And I'll just mention, you know, all these workforce-focused tools are going to be available from NREC and Touchstone late this fall. So the member-facing tools and resources and research and strategies are all on our website now. But this next phase is to come in the fall. We're working on it now. That's great. And we've been doing a lot of interviews here at the Tech Advantage Expo. We, we keep coming back to, okay, you got a crystal ball. Give us a sense, as detailed as you can be, both, I guess, from the co-op perspective, Holly and Cheryl, from kind of the broader, what's the workplace going to look like in five years, 10 years, 25 years? Yeah, so from our research, in the next five years, I mean, okay, we sit here now and there's rampant media fear around COVID-19, right. right? And so looking how anything globally impacts the business, it actually accelerates a lot of change that needs to happen. So this, this incident that we're dealing with right now is speeding up remote workers. There's been organizations talking about remote workers. Now they're going, oh, we can only do this remote because of this situation, right? So that's one example. In the next five years, we're going to see an increase in remote workers, freelance workers. This is why rural is a positive thing because you can live remotely and still work 
globally. And that's why it's a huge advantage. And I see it as something you need to lean into as, hey, come live here and have a, a life with your family while still being able to work and, and you know have the lifestyle that you want to create. So I think five years, we're going to see more and more of that. 10 years, much, much more. First of all, people's skills will have to change dramatically because AI and automation and robotics are going to take on the repetitive work, the menial work. Even in the farming community, I've done some work with agriculture, there's self-driving tractors now. So the skills aren't about being able to sit in a tractor, the skills are about being able to technologically run that tractor, right? So in 10 years, we're gonna look completely different than how we look. We'll still be gathering as people. I think the human factor will increase dramatically in that we need to be better human beings and we need to focus on what makes us uniquely human versus becoming automated like the technology, which, that's part of the argument with the younger generation is they're so attached to their devices that a lot of the judgment is, well, they don't know human to human or they don't know face to face. It's like, actually, they see FaceTime and Skype as face to face. So five years, we're going to see more remote workers, more freelance, more consulting, more definitely the retired faction will be retired in that five year period. And then in 10 years, because it'll be primarily millennial Gen Z, Gen X run enterprises, I think we're going to see people with more free time. I honestly do. Our research has shown that that's what people want. It's happening now already. You can work pretty much anywhere, depending on what the nature of your work is. 20 years. robots (laughs) (laughs) robots <laughs> 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 go ahead Holly yeah to Cheryl's point about in-person interactions we found in our research that while technology is just an essential part of life for this generation they highly value authentic in-person interactions probably because we're so tied to our phones all the time like having a genuine real conversation with someone is really um, impactful and I think that's maybe a sweet spot that the co-ops can Mm -hmm. leverage is combining that community personal local focus with the opportunities that technology provides. And we think about the workforce. One thing that I hear a lot about cooperatives is that many of them are siloed. You know, even in a small co-op, one department doesn't know what the other is doing. I think to be successful in managing through some of these transformational changes that are happening at the industry, the broad industry level, those silos are going to have to come down. And you're going to see more integrated workplaces, more cross-functional teams tackling the bigger problems facing the co-ops, more different job functions at the strategic planning table. We're going to have to work that way to be successful through these changes. Yeah. Well, this is fascinating and exciting. Personally, I'm quite excited to see how this develops. So Cheryl, Holly, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks as well to our sponsor, Census, and to you, our listeners. For this and other podcasts, visit our website, electric.coop. Until next time, I'm Scott Hoffman. I'm Caroline Reese from Sussex Rural Electric Cooperative in Sussex, New Jersey. Thanks for listening to Along Those Lines. Subscribe and rate us on your favorite podcast app.